The idea of a human exoskeleton is not new. Concept drawings dating back to the 19th century reveal the depth of our desire to create a mobile suit that can give us superhuman powers. GE attempted just that in the 1960s when they invented the world's first powered exoskeleton, the Hardy Man. However, it required far too much power to work and was always tethered to a plug. In the last decade, due to breakthroughs in power efficiency and battery capacity, truly mobile exoskeletons are walking out of the prototype phase and into our daily lives. One of the things that I've learned being in a wheelchair is that the world looks down at you. And people don't mean to, but you're not at eye level with anyone. So when I'm an exo, I can stand and have a conversation eye to eye. Two weeks before high school graduation, I was 18 years old. Five friends and myself were driving to a friend's lake house. We were driving late at night and there was road construction. They didn't mark the road or even have construction signs out. I didn't see the turn coming and I drove straight off a 600 foot cliff. Exobionics is basically ground zero for exoskeletons. So we do all the design work here. We do all the manufacturing here. We do prototyping here. We do testing here. In the early days, we, we try to find what we call our test pilots to, to help us evaluate and improve the exoskeleton, kind of like first flight, and it's the first time using exoskeletons. Each test pilot is paired up with a trained physical therapist who closely monitors the test pilot's movements and guides them through the rehabilitation process. So the exoskeleton helps support Matt to stand up. With that, the exoskeleton legs are the external support for him and actually distributes the weight of the device through the ground. And then it allows Matt to actually weight bear through his own bones. We have adjustability in the lower leg and the upper leg. What you see here is the hip motor and the knee motor that actually helps to power the leg and actually replicates the muscles. We have lithium ion batteries as the power source and a computer that's essentially the backpack. So there's an interface on the crutch that helps Matt to be more autonomous with the walking. He can initiate that walk cycle, shift his weight, find that balance point, and trigger his first initial step. I'd been in a wheelchair for three years before I first walked in EXO. And that day that I got to stand again was very emotional. There was a mission at the end of the day, and we wanted to make a robot that helped people. And I was excited to be part of the team that did that. So I see a future of exoskeletons where people are grabbing them out of their garage to go on a run through the mountains so they can cover much more ground because of the exo. I think there's a ton of applications for them in the future, and it's just the more we can get it out there, the more ubiquitous it'll be. Since February 2012, they have helped people take more than 17 million steps that would have otherwise been impossible. In the next five years, we could be seeing exoskeletons in construction sites all over the world. Eventually, they will be so lightweight, our clothes will be lined with exoskeletons that make us stronger and faster. And one day, this technology could replace the wheelchair altogether. For now, exoskeleton designers are taking it one step at a time. As someone who's benefited from wearing an exoskeleton robot, I look at the future and I see it, it's very bright. Wearing exoskeletons to me in 20 years is gonna be a normal thing, like putting on pants in the morning instead of transferring into my wheelchair. I'll just get up and it'll be a daily thing for me and I'll have a normal active life. Want more Cyborg Nation? Then hit that subscribe button. From military suits to industrial exoskeletons to Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. <laughs> oh, those Mexico exoskeletons.